I've seen a lot of debate and ignorance around the upcoming Little Mermaid movie and its casting. There are a lot of people that seem to have strong opinions regarding the mermaid's color and how it relates to accuracy of the story, or at least the Disney tale they remember it as. So, sure, let's go ahead and talk about mermaid color. In the original 1837 story by Hans Christian Andersen, the Little Mermaid was described as the prettiest of them all. Her skin was as clear and delicate as a rose leaf, and her eyes as blue as deepest sea. But like all the others, she had no feet, and her body ended in a fish's tail. The phrase clear and delicate as a rose leaf can be interpreted in different ways. Is clear meaning transparent as the skin of a jellyfish with all organs exposed? The comparison to a rose leaf might indicate green skin. The illustrations across the different editions do little to clarify matters, depicting a plethora of shapes and hues. The original story really gets us nowhere, so maybe we should turn to marine biology. To get to the bottom of this, we need to look into what the local Piscean wildlife was like. Copenhagen sits between the North Sea and the Baltic Sea. This means that the mermaid's lineage could include mackerel, cod, sea trout, flounder, and herring. There is even a possibility of our mermaid being of anglerfish descent. So we're going to need to look closer at the color and fin placement if we want accuracy. So let's look at her parents. King Triton's blue tail suggests the possibility of him being bluefin tuna, but the real hint lies in his title as king. I would conclude that King Triton and Athena are king mackerels. Their many daughters are obviously of many species except for Aquata, who also appears to have that same king mackerel coloration. Taking the existing full-blooded daughter into account, that does mean that they spawned at some point. The 2004 paper Mackerel Egg Predation by Cannibalism During the Spawning Season by Ignacio Alonso et al. states that half of the king mackerel's diet consists of crustaceans. Sebastian isn't just a snack. He's a snack while the other half of their diet is soft tissue, mostly eggs. Indeed, the largest factor of mortality for king mackerel eggs is cannibalism by the parents. Since king mackerel lay an average of 500,000 eggs at a time, I have to ask, where are the other 499,999 siblings, and why would they keep Aquata around? What sort of morbid trophy is she? Since it is obvious that they kidnapped the rest of their daughters while conquering the seas, they don't necessarily have to be of a local species. Clearly, they include a Garibaldi, yellow goatfish, whalefish, two purple dotty backs, and then we have Ariel. But before we get to her, we have to note that his collection of daughters infers his conquering and pillaging of the Red Sea, Southern Atlantic, and most of the Pacific. So, who rules the Indian and Arctic oceans? Why doesn't Triton address it? What unspoken horrors of the deep makes the Mad King tremble? Ariel, by coloration, is also a mackerel, but not a king mackerel. The slight aqua color indicates that she is a cero mackerel, a cousin of the king. Is this a simple case of adopting within the family? Not so fast. Her sweeping, delicate tail tells us something more. That is no mackerel tail. That is the tail of a comet goldfish. So how did that coupling happen? One is freshwater and the other is marine. What dating app put those two species together? Was one of them catfished? Without clear notes about species, it's almost impossible to make any determinations about the Little Mermaid's color, and we can't trust any of the retellings even Disney's, when they have strayed so far from the original story. The one where Ariel, in a jealous rage, plots to murder Eric before committing suicide and turning into sea foam. You see, fairy tales and other folk tales preserve cultural traditions while remaining flexible enough to respond to changing conditions. The power of folk tales lies in their adaptability over time. Story details evolve to reflect the cultural and ethnic diversity of our modern world so that they can remain relevant and relatable to everyone. So, if you came here expecting me to debate the skin tone of Ariel's human half, you are mistaken. There is no debate to be had. Ariel never existed, mermaids aren't real, and Disney didn't create her. There is no historical context to live up to. For children of color, it has been proven that underrepresentation and discrimination results in feelings of racial and gender inferiority that begin in early childhood. 
In the 1940s, psychologists Kenneth and Mammy Clark conducted experiments known as the Doll Test to assess the impact of discrimination and segregation on African American children's racial perceptions. When presented with dolls of varying skin tones, the majority of the black students preferred the white doll with yellow hair, assigning positive traits to it. Meanwhile, most discarded the brown doll with black hair, assigning it negative traits. The Clarks concluded that black children formed a racial identity by the age of three and attached negative traits to their own identity, which were perpetuated by segregation and prejudice. Throughout the 20th century, the media portrayed almost all heroes, romantic leads, and princesses as white. The roles given to people of color were always as sidekicks, comic relief, servants, or criminals. I grew up watching movies and cartoons for Superman, Batman, Iron Man, Thor, Doctor Strange, Spider-Man, The Punisher, Captain America, The Hulk, Wolverine, Aquaman, The Flash, Green Lantern, The Fantastic Four, Daredevil, Ghost Rider, all white. It wasn't until 1997 that Spawn and then 98 that Blade became two of the first mainstream black superhero films. And even now, in the MCU, there were 17 films made starring white or alien characters before they made Black Panther. For a country that celebrates diversity, they lack representation. In 1989, the attachment of white children to Disney characters such as Ariel derived from their racial identification with white princesses. Disney taught them that princesses were always white and that being valued and beautiful meant being white. Now adults, these Disney fans are nostalgic for the white cartoon characters with which they grew up and are willing to deny that same representation experience to a whole different generation of children of color. Whose childhood memories and viewing experiences matter most, your own or those of today's children? <laughs>